So this is uh, the Wellness Forum September edition brought to you by the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Health Sciences, the University of Nairobi, and uh, our speaker today is uh, none other than Dr. Pete Odera. I will be sharing uh, his introductory presentation in a, in a few minutes. So Dr. Pete Odera, the innovator, icon, and inspiration, he's a multiple award winner and nominee for, the, for over three decades. He is the co-founder of the famous Kisima Awards, and this is Kenya's equivalent to the Grammy Awards. His journey has seen him grow from a boy whose roots are in a tiny fishing village on Lake Victoria to now traveling all over the world to speak before large audiences, including four presidents, various ambassadors and dignitaries, both locally and globally. He has toured extensively around the East African community and also in Zimbabwe, South Africa, and the United States as a highly sought after speaker. Indeed, uh, in the streets, he is called the godfather of contemporary gospel music. His groundbreaking band called Heart was formed in 1993 and went on to become one of the most well-known Kenyan bands in the 90s. His music has seen him share the stage with Grammy Award winners like Sissy Winans, Donnie McClacken, Ron Kenoli, Rebecca Malope, and the legendary Papa Wimba. He has also recorded music with the Grammy and Dove Award winner band Jazz of Clay, and has also written and thereafter produced music for the Cora Award winner Eric Wainaina, MTV Award winner Wahoo Kagui, and the Kenyan R&B soul artist June Gashui. This uh, happened uh, sometime in July. He is now the 39th Stellar Award winner, Internet Station of the Year, GodRadio1.com, Gospel On Demand. I'm, I should actually add the only African that won that award in the United States of America in July 2024. He's an author, recording artist, and a philanthropist. He has written several books and publications. He has recorded 10 albums, has featured on several compilation projects. He has been interviewed on various platforms and international media outlets, including the CBN, TBN, Reuters, among others. He is a founder of IXOS Institute that he founded in 2008, which is a training and mentorship hub of leaders. He has mentored people in various fields from business leaders, public sector executives, performers in the entertainment world, and emerging leaders globally. As a philanthropist, he supports the Garden of Hope Children's Home in Kajado County for the orphaned and vulnerable children. Ladies and gentlemen, Today, we are going to have a topic on navigate principles from the sea farers. Ancient mariners had the moon, the stars, to help them find direction in the sea as they set out for their trade and military expeditions. The NASA lunar space uh, had the benefit of the hundreds of mathematicians, astrophysics, and aeronautical engineers who helped point those early spacecrafts into outer space. Now we're in the modern time. Many of our leaders, both great and small, have been unskilled at having to navigate through the multiple modern crises that neither their skill, nor education, nor experience could ever prepare them for. How is it that after all the knowledge dispensed over the years concerning all manner of fields, even intelligent and well-read leaders, can still find themselves lost in circumstances. In today's presentation, and do some of the thinking around transitions and allow leaders to arm themselves with tools to make quality decisions using some interesting true stories and a little bit of humor. 
But if they're not funny, I will laugh on your behalf. Ladies and gentlemen, the Wellness Forum, September edition. Navigate principles from seafarers, guest speaker, Dr. Pete Odera. You're welcome, sir. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I hope um, that you all can hear me. If you can't, just let me know. I'll be happy to make whatever adjustment I need to make. Um, thank you for thank you for inviting me, and I'm really, really, really um, grateful to be here. Um, I usually introduce myself by saying I wear many hats, um, but Dr. Ida's made such a good job of it. I don't know if I need to do any further, but I usually introduce myself in in and I try to package it in a way that people will remember. I usually say I'm a minister, I'm a musician, I'm a mentor and a media broadcaster. And sometimes I usually add, and father of two adult daughters, uh, Errol, who just turned 24 uh, in August, and Michaela, who just turned 22 in July. And that last bit is to ward off any heat-seeking missiles from my audience. Um, sometimes my audience, <laughs> you know what I mean. <clears throat> I'm hopefully, hopefully I'll be able to um, make sense uh, to us this morning. And uh, my, my travels have afforded me um, many opportunities. I'm very um, grateful and humbled by some of the things that I've been able to achieve in you know, the last, I don't know, 50 years or so. One of these hats, which I'm most recently famous for, is the radio broadcaster of Good Morning Africa, uh, an, internet, an, an internet radio show that um, I've been doing for the last four and a half years. As you've heard, uh, we just won the Stella Award for Internet Station of the Year, as was mentioned earlier. <clears throat> this event was broadcast to audiences in the millions on Stella TV, as well as uh, BET. Um, I think you can actually catch the read broadcast up to September 8th on BET. I'm not sure what the schedules are, but you'll be able to see that. Uh, the reason this is a bit hilarious for me is that I had no formal training for what I do. I had no formal training. I did not, I repeat, did not go to any school of journalism or broadcasting to learn and be examined for the thing I have won a huge award for. I think that is hilarious. The reason I start with this is, is twofold. <clears throat> Firstly, um, our country has become notoriously utilitarian, which stems from the corrupt idea that only formally trained people are useful in society. Um, it, it stems from that materialistic idea that the more money you have, the more stuff you can obtain, and so the more important you are. That's materialism, that's really what it is. Because or understand, are your hearts hearted? Do you, do you do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but? I'm hearing something. Hello. Um, All right, we're taking care of it. Sorry about that. Please, no as you're joining, uh, make sure that you mute yourself. Mute yourself as you join the meeting. Thank you. <clears throat> right, Dr. Yes. Sorry about was... that. We have parents now who advise their kids to be architects, to be lawyers or doctors, because they say things like, your course, you're in a market. Ama, your course, it's a letter door. This, this is the stuff that will bring you money or, or it will be marketable. This is why uh, many, especially in these fields, they walk around with an air of self-importance. Now, don't get me wrong. Saving lives as a doctor is very important. Uh, building sound buildings or designing sound buildings and, uh, as an architect is important. But many in these fields are finding themselves empty and unfulfilled. Secondly, and I think more importantly, I'd much rather see a doctor, a lawyer, or any other professional who is driven by a sense of purpose over an individual who is driven by profit. I think it was Dr. Martin Luther King who said that if you are a sweeper, be the very best sweeper that you could possibly be. I'm probably misquoting that, but. Uh, the idea there is that each one of us has a vocation or a space <clears throat> that, that they're supposed to fill. And it will be important for us to do that with, with a sense of purpose.
Now to my topic of the day. Um, I'm, I'm working on a book. It's entitled Navigate. And so I'll be reading. You're the first audience, by the way, who will hear uh, anything from this book, other than the editor and the publisher. There's nobody else uh, who's actually uh, um, heard or read anything. Uh, from this book. So <clears throat> uh, count, I, I suppose you're my guinea pigs. Let me start by saying birthdays aren't really a sign of progress because everybody has one. We need something more deliberate to mark. Allow me to read a little from my upcoming book, uh, Navigate, that will be published by Canon Media. All right. In 1497, Vasco da Gama left Lisbon and arrived in Malindi on the East African coast in present-day Kenya on the 14th of April, 1498. In 1499, he erected Bella. a padre, a limestone Bella. pillar with a cross on the top of it and bearing the Portuguese coat of arms. On my first trip to Malindi, my family and I visited the pillar that still stands opposite the Malindi Heritage Museum. The Sultan of Malindi allowed Vasco da Gama to erect the Padrao. This is that pillar with a cross on the top of it and bearing the coat of arms, as he was the first European to visit the East African coast. He had encountered hostility on most of the East African coast from as far south as present day Mozambique to nearby Mombasa. Vasco da Gama was famously ill-tempered and for a seafarer had little patience, which didn't serve him well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Da Gama also would quickly turn to his dark side, uh, causing him to carry out some baffling acts such as frequently abducting locals to hold as hostage for his safe return or some other reason. He did this in Malindi, in Kapadu in India, and possibly elsewhere on the vast African coast. He also, watch this, pretended to be a Muslim merchant when he first landed in Mozambique, but he was discovered and he had to flee. Historians had previously assumed that Vasco da Gama was met with hostile and warlike natives who seemed primitive in their eyes because that was the disposition of the locals. What they had not considered, as history now reveals, is that his reckless and deceitful behavior invited the retribution of the sultans of the Orient. You don't hear of this chauvinism elsewhere in Europe. <clears throat> Excuse me. Somehow, despite his boorish behavior, imperialist snobbishness and impatient disposition, Vasco da Gama was able to erect this pillar with the consent of the Sultan in Malindi. Diogo Sao, an earlier Portuguese explorer, erected at least four similar pillars on the West African coast scattered from Liberia to present day Namibia, while Bartolomeu Diaz erected one in present day Namibia and another in South Africa. Several of these survived to date over 500 years after they were erected. These pillars were not built in situ, but were carried on the ships that left Lisbon and were deliberately used to mark these sites where the Portuguese landed. These padrões must have weighed hundreds of kilograms, if not a couple of tons. Why would these sailors carry this dead weight on their ships when they could have carried more valuable goods in the space that they occupied for trade? These men left Portugal and the instruction from the king with the goal of establishing the Portuguese nation as a world trading and political power. These pillars weren't decorative or religious monuments even if they pretended they were. These were political proclamations of the pulchritude of the Portuguese potentates. King John II of Portugal was basically stating that his power extends this far and it served as a sign to those who were to come afterwards that he had laid claim to these lands. They were emblematic of the larger vision that the kingdom had. These padraos are littered all over the former Portuguese colonies and outposts. They were also markers for ships on these sea routes so that the sailors would know where they were on their journey. As we navigate our lives, it is important that we set up markers for our journey. If we are to be successful, we need to be able to measure our progress. This is why we have to set goals for our vision to become a reality. Our goals can be the modern day padrones and the markers for our advancement. Setting well thought out and realistic goals is an important exercise if we are to see our vision come to pass.
So that's part of a chapter, I believe it's chapter 14. Um, I think it's chapter 14. <clears throat> I believe it was chapter 14 of, um, of my book. And I, I hope that when it comes out, you'll all go out and get it. But the first thing I want to say today is, um, in, in my presentation is, what should we do in, in, in order to be successful in our journey of life? The first thing I want to say is set up these padraos, these pillars. One of the ways we can set up padraos in our journey is by doing annual personal retreats where we evaluate our past year and plan for the new year. Um, here at the Department of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology, we find that we have these monthly things and perhaps this can become an annual thing where people get together and really review what have we learned? What have we, what have we done? What have we, what have we done to improve ourselves? So sitting down with a journal or a notepad and creating the vision for what we want to see becomes that deliberate annual limestone pillar that we build and we can go back to see uh, how far we've come and how far we have to go. And I think that this is important for us to, to really begin to shape our journey because um, often we're tempted to measure our success by the accumulation of material things. Uh, setting a goal, by the way, to buy a house or a new car by a certain date is not bad in and of itself, but it can serve as a way to reward yourself for your efforts. But, <clears throat> excuse me, the danger that emerges with material things as a yardstick is to assume that the people who have these material things are actually successful. Uh, notorious gangsters, uh, I dare say, uh, Al Capone and Pablo Escobar had loads of cash and material possessions, but all as a result of their nefarious activities in the dark underworld of organized crime. But more importantly, there are some things that cannot be measured by material means. How do you measure by material means overcoming an addiction or passing an exam or recovering from an illness or an accident? So my encouragement to us this morning is to set up markers, build pillars, Remember, birthdays aren't really a sign of progress because everybody has one. We need something more deliberate, something more deliberate. The second thing I want to say to us this morning is to learn how to write things down. Now, I know this would seem um, like a silly thing to suggest or say to, to people in the medical profession. But other than the things that you do professionally, uh, find a journal, start to write things down. One of the things I encourage the people I mentor to do is to write things down. Regardless of where I am, I, I find a way to write things down. When I find myself in weddings or in funerals or some public gathering or other, I write down what I'm experiencing as a note on my phone. Um, <clears throat> so I write this down. So sometimes I look like I'm fiddling with, fiddling with my phone or browsing the internet, but really what I'm doing is writing down my thoughts. I'm writing down my thoughts. The way we know about these incredible journeys of these seafarers is from the journals that they kept. They didn't have phones, they didn't have cameras, they didn't have any of that. So they wrote these things down. Uh, at, at other times, other people on these trips, they kept journals on what they encountered. And as a result, we can relive their experiences. The reason we know about Bartolomeu Diaz and Vasco da Gama and all these people in the age of discovery is because of what they wrote down. Often when we go back on our journals from many years ago, it then becomes clear what our journey has been. Uh, there's something I used to say, and it went like this, the faintest ink is better than the strongest memory. In this digital age, you have many options. I'll say that again. The faintest ink is better than the strongest memory. <laughs> One of the young men I mentor, uh, I think it was 10, maybe 12 years ago, introduced me to Evernote. And I, I, I haven't gone back. In fact, I, I got to a point where Evernote warned me and told me that I've reached the maximum number of notes I can actually do for free. Uh, but if you're one of those people, there's Notepad for Apple users, et cetera. There's all these things. There's Samsung Notes, whatever. Whatever you prefer, but write it down. It's important to write it down. What this also does, it, it also allows you to process your thoughts before you fire off that nasty email to the head of the department. I think it's important for us to really process, to process, write things down. Um, I wanna talk about a third thing, but allow me to read again from one of the chapters of my upcoming book. Um, I think this is chapter eight or nine. I think it's chapter nine, I think. Um, I entitled it Fog. On Friday, March the 7th, 1533, the Portuguese vessel Bom Jesus 
left Lisbon for India and back as many ships at that time did. Its cargo would have been gold, ivory, spices, and other valuable wares that were common during this period. Somewhere along this journey, the bomb Jesus came along what the Portuguese sail sailors ended up calling the Porto de Inferno, the gates of hell along the Namibia and Angola coast near present day Orange Moon. Somewhere in the heavy fog off the Southwest African coast, this ship disappeared seemingly without trace. That was until the wreckage was discovered in 2008 by a group of diamond miners. The miners were looking to capitalize on the rich mineral deposits of this Southern African nation when they literally stumbled upon this old shipwreck. It is the most valuable shipwreck ever discovered on the West Coast of Africa. And it's valuable cargo of over 40 tons of ivory, copper ingots and over 2000 coins was mostly recovered. Fog has existed as long as the earth has had oceans, but fog wasn't a real problem until seafaring and especially mass transit came into existence. Fog can be at its simplest be defined as a low lying cloud close to the ground. It is formed when there is intense condensation usually near a body of water and the topography or climatic conditions cause the fog to be formed. If you're a tree or grass or any kind of plant, fog is a welcome means of moisture. But if you're a pilot of a plane or a ship, fog can be deadly. Fog greatly impairs visibility and turns otherwise routine exercises into life and death episodes. On December 11th, 1990, fog settled on the Interstate 75 near Calhoun, Tennessee. The result was a 99 vehicle pileup that ended in multiple fatalities. In 1983, at the Madrid Barajas airport on December 7th, an aviacle McDonnell Douglas DC-9 made a wrong turn in the fog while preparing for takeoff. It turned right into the path of a Iberian Airlines Boeing 727 that was already speeding along on the runway for takeoff. The resultant accident and explosion caused 42 fatalities. The cause was ostensibly poor visibility and disorientation due to heavy fog. The bomb is a tale of many a fog-related accident in both aviation and maritime history. In late April or early May on that journey to India, after getting past the, some of the most critical obstacles on the Atlantic Ocean, the bomb Jesus entered the foggy coasts of Southern Africa and vanished without trace. For close to 500 years, this ship's disappearance remained a mystery until the accidental discovery of the wreckage during a mining expedition. In 1498, the Portuguese erected a lighthouse at Malindi on the East African coast that's still in existence. It served as a marker and director to sailors going to East India. We'll talk more about this in a later chapter. In more modern times, the foghorn was invented. The foghorn is an implement used to warn ships about rocky shores or other vessels where the light from a lighthouse may be obscured. And then buoys are often placed as markers and guides for vessels and stay stable even in the worst of weather conditions. These are the various interventions which sailors have invented to help guide their journey in the waters when the conditions aren't clear. When your ship is in the oceans, op open, excuse me, when your ship is in the open sea, there isn't much of a problem or challenge posed by rocks or other ships. But when you get close to your destination and things become uncertain because of poor weather conditions, you need the assurances of these markers so as to arrive safely. This is often how life is. As long as we're sailing along in a good job with great benefits or in a great relationship until transi transition moments come along, everything is fine. Suddenly, seemingly tranquil colleagues, friends or relatives become hostile adversaries and the journey to the safe haven that was a promotion or a wedding is now a delicate navigation around the craggy shores of office politics or wedding negotiations. You need a lighthouse, a foghorn and some buoys to help guide you. That's a bit of a long read, but uh, uh, another chapter, I'm hoping that this is not just entertaining you, but that it's also enlightening. Um, ladies and gentlemen, don't allow the fog of life to jeopardize your destiny. But Dr. Pete, how can I avoid a situation where unclear parameters threaten my trajectory? How is it that 
uh, I'm in a relationship that looks like it's heading towards marriage. How do I make it work? Uh, because you know what? Medics actually also get married. They actually get married. Um, one of the things I, I've done over the past 20 years, I've been a minister and I, I, I've carried out weddings and marriages, so I do this. So I have a thing I usually tell those who come to me for premarital counseling. It's a useful thing for marriage, but it also applies to the critical transition points or the crossroads of life. Um, so there's something I say that can be summed up in what I call the three Vs. The three Vs are values, vision, and verb. Values, vision, and verb. Your values, your vision, and your verb. Um, and your verb is, that's another word for passion. How to handle stress. Well, your values, your vision, and your verb <laughs> must align <laughs> your values for it. Let me say that again. I think we had an interruption. Your values, your vision, and your verb or your passion must align if you're to avoid shipwreck. Your values loosely defined determine the ethos you live by. This could be the three or four things that serve as a compass for you to make your decisions. For example, um, personal values could be integrity, hard work, honesty, loyalty, excellence, etc. Just pick two or three of those things that are your values. That would you talk every morning. These are the things that you go by. If you are a company, this would be what drives everything that you do. If you are a company, for example, if you're a company, you'd say that we are driven by integrity, by hard work and loyalty, or we're driven by honesty and excellence. Your vision, loosely defined, is where you're going. Where do you see yourself in the future? And I know that, you know, um, you know when you're going for employment opportunities, they, they ask, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself in three years? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? That's your vision. That's really where you see yourself. Your verb, another word for passion, is, is this, what are you passionate about? What are the things that drive you? What are the things that drive you? And it's important to really understand what these things are. Because if these three things align, usually the couple is on the right path. I say that, um, also saying this, it's not a guarantee, but it's a beginning. If these three things align, for those of you who are thinking on those paths, if these three things align, your values, your vision, and your verb, if they align, then the couple is on the right path. Now, if you're similarly faced with a big decision and you have these things clearly articulated, this doesn't just apply in marriage, it actually applies in life. For example, you could be, um, uh, at a place where you need to choose between uh, going to the school of dentistry or starting to be a gynecologist. Um, now, these things, your values, your vision, and your passion, those are the things that should help you make those decisions. Whether you should uh, buy a plot of land, whether you won't have much trouble making up your mind if your vision, your values, and your verb are clearly articulated. But sometimes the best thing to do let me say this, it seems also like uh, an antithesis of what I've just said. The best thing to do on a foggy day out at sea is to wait it out until the fog clears. I wanna say this because I understand that there are many um, millennials and Gen Zs that I speak to. I found that millennials, but generally young people are impatient. Um, young people want things now, now, now. A good marriage, a great career, a healthy body, whatever it is, all of these take time and patience. So wait it out and develop some patience. I think patience is one of the values that I feel that if we begin to practice and begin to uh, prize, uh, then we'll begin to see great uh, results in our lives. I want to talk about, uh, I guess, one, or one, more, one more thing before I'm done and then I'll leave room for questions. And this is important. Number four is be accountable. Be accountable. Usually when we talk about accountability, it's often in a negative sense. Again, our Kenyan context has made us stew in a culture where the brokenness of our systems has normalized dysfunction. So when we are held accountable, when somebody says you're held accountable, it's usually because of some gross misdemeanor on our part. Accountability, let me avert to you this morning, is not a negative thing. In fact, it is the thing that will very often prove the validity of your goals in life. <clears throat> if you're an artist, as I am, uh, one side of me is an artist, you will tend to want to be liberated from all the shackles of norms and convention. Uh, 
but I, I'm, 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 I, I think it's important for us to understand that in the words of, um, uh, I, I wish I had made a presentation for it. There was an old Pirelli tire advert that said something like this, power is nothing without control. And this was the slogan of the Pirelli tires in the 1993 advertising campaign. It had the legendary sprinter Carl Lewis at the starting blocks. And uh, some of you may remember Carl Lewis. Um, Carl Lewis was a Olympic, multiple Olympic uh, 100 meters, um, 100 meters long jump, uh, 200 meters champion. He was amazing. Um, and it, what's interesting is that this is sort of like a sidebar. Uh, if Carl Lewis was competing at these last Olympics, uh, he would have finished last. Uh, that all the guys who finished at the last 100 meters at the Olympic Olympics did better than his best times. It's quite unbelievable. Uh, but this Pirelli tires ad had the legendary, this legendary sprinter uh, at the starting blocks. He was wearing these red high heeled stilettos. The idea behind it was that you could have all this power to do incredible things, but have no guardrails. Uh, and of course, you know that um, a sprinter doesn't sprint with high heels. A sprinter uses his sprinting spikes, um, and uh, the the spikes give him better control than high heels. That nothing against high heels, ladies. Nothing against high heels. Um, history, I want to say, is replete with the train wrecks of those who, for lack of some measure of accountability, crash their organizations, their careers, or family. Um, I've, I've spoken on several occasions about uh, world figures. This is not in any way to disparage them, but really to really talk about what actually happened. Um, we remember the uh, female athlete, uh, Marion Jones, incredible sprinter, incredible athlete, uh, but it was discovered that she was using um, steroids uh, and banned substances uh, to cause a performance enhancing drugs to cause her to, to be better or to perform better. Uh, this lack of, in fact, that account, the problem with that is that the person that she was supposed to be accountable to was the person who was supplying her with these performance enhancing drugs. Um, you know, the story of uh, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, who was uh, the head of one of the, uh, I, I believe it's the IMF at the time, was heading back uh, to France to, walk into what was literally a open chapter for him to become the head of the Republican Party. And that was an open avenue for him to become then the president of France. And uh, th there was an incredible incident that happened. He was arrested in first class at Air France at uh, JFK and pulled off the plane uh, ostensibly because uh, there had been an issue where there was somebody who had accused him of uh, sexual uh, harassment. And that case went on and on and on. Uh, but this is what I say, that sometimes the accountability is, 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 is um, something that's um, ignored by those who are in places of power. It's important, especially the higher you go in your career, the higher you go in in your organization. It is important to have some measure of accountability. I don't just mean this for an, in a negative sense. I mean this also in a positive sense. Let me share something, uh, something personal. My friend, Emmanuel Mbevi, and I love to go to eat. Uh, we go out together to eat fish. Now, he lived in South Africa for many years, but when he moved back to Kenya, we started meeting at Mama Ulech's fish restaurant. The restaurant is famous for serving delicious tilapia and has been visited by world famous icons such as Idris Elba and uh, Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg. So Emmanuel and I would agree on a suitable Tuesday or Wednesday and we would look forward to these lunches. Um, but these lunches didn't start as recently as when he moved back from South Africa. What we really have done is all these years during those lunches is talk about where we are in life. We began doing this as teenagers where we would do sleepovers every so often to hold each other accountable. Now, I've known Emmanuel since I was in standard one when we were six years old. Uh, I'm 55 now. Uh, I just turned 55 last week. Um, and he's one of the friends that I've known uh, for these 49 years. I mean, we've been close that long. 
So these lunches and meetups that we have kept for over 20 years have been our padroids or our pillars where we can ask each other where our goals are, where are we on our goals, what plans and ideas have we progressed, uh, you know, what's really happening in our marriages, what's really happening in our lives, what's going on, how is our health. There's some things that over time an accountability partner will do for you that other people can't do. This is just so important. And I don't mean this in, in like I said, in a negative sense. It can be a friend. It can be a person who you're walking with. And I, I think it's important, especially in this generation, the present generation, uh, where, like, again, I've said, it's it's easy to become utilitarian. Uh, you know, you use friends. Uh, and, and, and I think it's important for us to be a different kind of person where we value friends we value friends where we value those relationships because you you see i i i started to talk about this maybe 10 15 years ago when i was a minister at the church that um, i was ministering it's it's important uh, for us to find these people that we can surround ourselves with who we can call at 2 a.m i call them the 2 a.m people and I usually have this thing, and it, it actually, I think from some of the people that I met, it became famous and it's sort of gone online. Uh, I, I like to ask, who can you call at 2 a.m. who will answer? So number one, who can you call at 2 a.m.? Number two, who will answer? And number three, who will come to where you are if you were in trouble? Who can you call? Who would answer? And who would come? I think this is important. Now, I say this because sometimes we surround ourselves, you know, uh, we surround, you know, online, we have 5,000 friends on Facebook, and I don't know how many other followers, wherever, and all these things that we say, but we, we still have people dying lonely, still dying lonely. I think this to me is unfortunate. You know, the people who I really feel that we really need to edit and put into our circle are those people who we say, I can call this person at 2 a.m. and they would come and vice versa. They can call me at 2 a.m. and I'll go to where they are. But to have those kind of people in your circle, to have that kind of accountability means that at first that you are already stripping yourself to the place where you're saying, you know what, I'm going to be accountable. Why is this important as somebody who is a medic? I think that's critical because then those are the first people who will know how you really are doing. Those are the first people who will know, wow, you know, is that what you're really going through? Because, you know, from the outside, you know, when people from the outside looking, look at, um, at, at, at you guys in the medical field, you know, um, the high achievers and whatever it is that we, we view you as, we don't really see how broken uh, medics can be, how, how those long hours, uh, those uh, continually saving lives can just wear on you. So you need a, a group of people, you need a, a, a circle, that that you can literally be open with and i i know i'm uh preaching to the choir in this in this regard i think it's important those people should share your values those people should know your vision those people should match your passion that's what i feel that those people need to be and maybe you don't have that kind of person right now open yourself to the possibility you know that there's somebody in your circle who you can begin to become uh, friends with and be willing to be transparent now the trouble with this is is this is that is that when you begin to open to when you're transparent when you become vulnerable to people they can take your mess and it becomes a subject online and so you really have to be careful and find the kind of people who who share your values uh, and who will keep your secrets. I'm not saying that we should walk around with our emotions on our sleeve, but also uh, not walk around being overly protective. I think this is important. Um, I wanna finish with an interesting, I wanna finish this point with an interesting, uh, interesting but true story. In 1995, uh, I went on a personal retreat uh, after my time with my band Heart uh, had come to a close. My band heart, now, um, it, it's unfortunate that this band was how it was um, before the age of the internet. Um, I, I really, I, I'm really not doing this story justice. The, the band was super famous and notorious. And um, I, I'm, I'm not saying this to boast about what it was that we're doing. I'm really saying this so that you can begin to understand the, the place that this band had in, in my life. Uh, it was my job. It was the only thing that I did at the time. We had just 
um, signed a record deal with a German a record label. I believe we were the first, um, I, I think we're the first, wow. I, in history, I, I think we can argue, I arguably say we're the first gospel group to sign a record label with an international record, a record deal with an international record label. Um, and we were on all the big shows that was at the time, Jamadelic and, and what have you. Uh, gospel groups didn't, didn't get on those shows at that time. Um, you know, we, I, we, had, we were the first gospel, modern urban gospel group that had a uh, video. You can actually see it on YouTube. Just look for Heart. The song was called Show You Love, just to show you how, um, um, I say modern. Uh, let me say it like this. If you can see Saudi Soul right now or, or Heart the Band, that is how we looked. I wish I had a picture. I really should have done a presentation. Heart the Band or Saudi Soul, that's how we looked in 1993, in 1993. Uh, and so we were ahead of our time. And it was such a controversy, it was such a controversy because people didn't look like that at the time. Uh, and so we had reached a, a certain point and we needed to turn the, the band. There was a turn in my life and my time with the band came to an end. Uh, and for me, when that time came, it was more like a flight in search of a safe refuge for the weariness in my soul. I was very weary because we'd done all these things and and there was no um, there was no real money to be made in the um, music business. Uh, and so, you know, broke, dejected. Um, the other thing I didn't say is that I had been engaged at the time to, oh, I have a, a complete story about that on, I did an engaged talk about this. I'd been engaged to marry this girl and, and that engagement broke up. Um, and so I was sort of drifting in the sea. So I went to Mombasa um, um, on the Kenyan seacoast to stay with my aunt. Yeah. Um, Henry Njimbok was a captain in the Kenyan Navy. <clears throat> so I went to stay with him. After a while, my head began to clear and I started to get clarity on what I was to do next. I sat at his desktop computer, a Pentium 1, I think, a Hewlett Packard PC that had a floppy disk drive, which you could use to save your files. Now, I know that some of us may, I don't know if you even know what a floppy drive was. So I, I was sitting at his desktop computer on this Pentium Hewlett Packard, um, typing what my goals should be. I was typing this thing out. I began to write out the four or five things I was going to do in my next iteration and saved it as a word file on a floppy disk. So somehow what happened with that computer is that it automatically saved it on the computer as well. And I forgot, I completely forgot about this for many years to come. So, you know, you take the, um, I, I printed the, um, I printed the, the paper out and uh, I thought I had deleted the files, but it was still on there. Um, several years later, uh, I was asked to sing at a funeral service for a pianist friend, um, a friend of mine, um, uh, Paul Mbaye, who was a pianist and the master of ceremonies that day was Captain Henry Nyambok. After the service, he came over to where I was standing outside the church hall and he said, good job and well done on your achievements. I politely thanked him and I was going to say something accommodating when he went on. He said, you achieved everything you wrote down in 1995. I read the document you had written on my computer and I've kept it ever since that time. This is when I realized I had inadvertently recruited someone who was quietly observing from a distance and marking my progress. Perhaps that's what we need to do deliberately. Have a someone like a Captain Henry Nyambo to remind us ever so often that we set up some goals as pillars of our progress. That's what I mean by accountability. People often call these people accountability partners or whatever, but they are important in helping us erect our padrao to mark our journey. Um, I want to begin my conclusion by saying this. It, it takes a, a different kind of mind to be successful in today's minefield of life. Some of the problems we are facing as Kenyans or Africans isn't because we are black, but because we are blind. There's a way of thinking that insists that the way things have been done is the way it always should have been done. 
this kind of thinking would never champion, it would never have championed this age of discovery in the 14th and 15th century. Now you have to understand that for these people to leave the safety of the coast that they knew, the safety of the places that they knew to go to the seemingly unknown um, outside of Europe or whatever it is that they were traveling, it took a kind of mind that says there's something more. We have to think of something outside of where we are today. That kind of thinking that kind of thinking is the one that solves major problems. The kind of thinking that says things have always been this way, they're always going to stay this way, stay safe, that will never solve tomorrow's problems. In fact, things like the COVID pandemic required that we become lateral thinkers. And that's what I'd like us to start thinking. My goal today was to provoke you as medics and others who may have joined us to open our minds to lateral thinking. I know we're used to people coming and giving us five points to do this or that with your life. What I would like to see is young medics emerge out of here and change the world. Take the current knowledge available and turn it on its head. Think outside the box. So I say to bankers, surely with all the technology available, why should a check still take three or four days to clear? I say to Kenyan researchers and scientists, surely with gene sequencing and artificial intelligence, why haven't we as Africans and Kenyans leapfrogged and become the South Korea or Singapore's of Africa? It's our thinking, ladies and gentlemen, it's our thinking. It's that thinking that says you can't and you shouldn't. That thinking that keeps you safe on the shores of whatever it is that you're doing right now. It's that thinking that says that this thing can't be done or it shouldn't be done because I'm a woman or I'm, I'm young, I'm a medic, I'm an African, whatever that constrictor is. It's that thinking that keeps us small. Um, Al Jarreau, the famous jazz musician, was a medical doctor, but we don't know him for his medicine. I know some of you are going to uh, go and uh, look him up. Al Jarreau, jazz musician, incredible jazz musician. His music resonated much better than his medical practice. We don't know him for his med medicine. We know him for his music. Maybe you're here in this audience and you really should have become a professional golfer. Maybe you're in this audience and you really should have become a musician or something else, but you were talked into a so-called safe career. Don't get stuck in the fog of convention. Don't get stuck in the safety of convention. Don't get stuck in the place that it's what my teacher said, it's what my parents said, it's what my village is expecting of me, it's what's expected of women. I want to challenge you to think outside the box, to think outside the box and say that you're going to make something out of your life. And it doesn't necessarily have to be something that, you know, you get paid millions of dollars for, it would be great, but it's something that will keep you fulfilled. I want to say this to you and challenge you this morning, not because um, you aren't in a fantastic practice, but maybe your dream is dying inside of you because you are stuck in convention. I want to ask us if we're going to change Kenya, if we're going to change medicine, if we're going to change and be the kind of people who will bring transformational things and introduce a new generation in our country that will be transformational, that will become the envy of other African nations, then it's that kind of thinking, that kind of unconventional thinking, that kind of lateral thinking that will say to us, you know what? I know that I'm a woman. I know that I'm young. I know that I'm an African. I know that it should be, but I will challenge the status quo and I will do things differently. I will stand up and be different. I'll stand up and be counted in my generation and decide that I'm going to do things differently. I'm going to ask us to consider that this morning you will thank yourself for it and the world will be better for it thank you very much for your time i hope that i've been um a help to somebody i hope that i've been an inspiration and blessings to you all thank you for your time thank you dr pete um i can see there were a few comments that were going on as the presentation as you were making your presentation and a few claps uh, here and there. I can see some clap reactions. Uh, maybe let me start with a question. Um, how exactly do you get to identify your 2 a.m. person? As how do you like know that this is my friend? And then how do you now get to identify that? You know what? I think this would be my 2 a.m. person that I can call and they can call me. Um, 
you know, and come to my aid and I go to their aid. Thank you. Um, I, I want to say maybe maybe two things in response to that. The, the first quick response is this, is that um, number one is identifying that person. You have to be aware, self-aware enough to say, to know that I need this kind of person in my life. I need this kind of person in my life. So that's the first step. It, it says that I need this kind of, of help in my life. Uh, but the second thing is, uh, I, I suppose it's kind of trial and error. Um, you, you know how it is when when uh, when you're dating. I suppose when you're dating, you're trying to find a date or you're trying to go out with somebody. You're, you're really What you're really doing is you're trying to figure out um, uh, who is this person? How is this person? So you go out together and you order a meal and you see how they behave. You know, do they do they order the most expensive thing on the menu? If they order the most expensive thing on the menu and expect you to pay, please understand that that person is not going to go the whole length with you. So understanding your own personal values and what you want out of life, I think is the first step. And then the second thing is being daring enough to go out and then measure. Now that doesn't mean that every time you're going out with somebody, because again, we're not trying to be utilitarian. Uh, um, you know, you're, you're not trying to be utilitarian and say, uh, you know, it's, this is how we talk about it. We say, uh, I only walk with lions. We've said things like that. I only walk with lions. That's great if, you're a lion, uh, but the reality is this, is that in life you have all kinds of people. All of us in our family have that one person who even if you wanted them to be a lion, they are complete rabbits, you know, or, or something else, some other silly animal, you know, that you, you just say this, this has, but the idea there is this, is that there'll always be people who um, have, uh, are, for lack of a better term, are weak and need our support. So these are not the 2 a.m. people because that kind of a person, if you call that person at 2 a.m., they'll be fast asleep and their phone will be off or something else. They, they will let you down. But what I will say is this, is, is um, associating, uh, associating with people who have high values. Uh, and I think, you know, some of you guys call them high vibration people. Um, but what it really is, is this. Those kind of people go to specific places. I'm almost sure that you will not find that kind of a person at 2 a.m. at Quiver. Um, Quiver is a famous church uh, in our city. <laughs> so Quiver, listen, if you go to Quiver, I've got nothing easy. But listen, if at 2 a.m. you need somebody and they're at Quiver, the reality is this, that kind of person may not be able to help you. What you really need is a person of high values, people who, who have high values. And I think that this is easy, they're easy to spot. Uh, people with high values and people who are um, um, not necessarily just high achievers, but high values and people who have um, proven integrity, proven integrity. And I think that that's important for us to do. Uh, that's that's one of the ways I do. And uh, like I said, uh, treat it like a date. Date the people who you befriend. You know, you, you shouldn't be full on, you know, BFFs with everybody with everybody who you meet. That's just, it's not even wise. Uh, being BFFs with everybody, who, it's, that's not wise. But but you could find uh, people, date your friends, date your friends. You know, I, I don't mean date for a romantic relationships. I mean, really go out and find out who this person really is. Find out, find out who this person is. Ask piercing questions like, you know, uh, what are your, what are your, um, what are your fears? What are your concerns? What are your goals in life? What are your values? <laughs> the, the quiver people are the best, somebody's saying. The quiver people are the best if you're there with them. Uh, and yeah, 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 yeah. But my experience has taught me something else. Maybe we we'll go to another question. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Pitt. Um, okay, so uh, I'm not seeing another question, but if you if you have a question, please feel free to post on the chat box. In the meantime, I will be reading out some um, comments uh, that I think I thought were uh, good. So somebody says, uh, Carl Lewis, now uh, Natuko age mates. Yes, yes, yes. In fact, he's older than you, uh, Dr. Kigondu. He just looks uh, 10 years uh, younger. Uh, all right, so accountability partner, that is 2 a.m. partners, and who can you call at 2 a.m.? And who uh, are you sure will answer and who will come? Yes, that was important. 
another comment here is accountability is very important. Thinking outside the box is the way. And then a few accolades, excellent presentation. Don't get stuck in the fog of conventional thinking. Uh, somebody else says, thank you so much. That was a very insightful, challenging, and inspiring all at the same time. Another person says, thank you for the talk. Very insightful, timely, and uh, good advice. Uh, another person says, integrity is important. Okay. So do we have any more questions? Uh, uh, Dr. Pete actually made this short and sweet so that he can um, entertain as many questions as possible. So if we... All right, somebody else says, yes, yes, please. Somebody else says, very insightful presentation. Could we get the recording uh, for those who joined in late? Yes, we always post this um, uh, audio-visual presentation at our OBS Guide Wellness Forum YouTube channel. So maybe this could be an amazing time to say, please go like, share, subscribe. <laughs> uh, yes, we have a YouTube channel, so. We will do, we'll send the link and the chat box as we go along. Yes, Dr. Pete, you may go ahead. Somebody said something, uh, sent me a direct message. It says, it takes a different kind of mind to champion our future to unknown directions. I think that's a very honest observation. Uh, it takes a different kind of mind. Um, you know, the, the friends I met in the year was, I think it was between 1985 in 1988. Um, those three years uh, were watershed years for me. And those people have remained in my life. Um, and there's a circle of them. Uh, Kimani Wainaina became my best man. Uh, Emmanuel Mbevi, we're friends. We're friends still today. So these are some of the guys who've been through the, through hell, um, the hell of life uh, on both sides. Uh, when, when, when um, we'd gone to a funeral and uh, my my youngest was very sick. We actually nearly lost her twice. It's my best man who went and fetched her and took her to the hospital. I found this out later. He took her to the hospital and paid the deposit for her at Nairobi Hospital. Um, and she was literally, if he hadn't done that, she would not have been with us. Now, I, I say this because um, we, we, became, we became a kind of person who created an environment around us where only that kind of a person uh, could come in. And I think this leads from where uh, the question that we had asked previously, it's a different kind of mind. Um, and that kind of mind uh, requires a self-awareness to say that I want better for myself. I want better for my community. I want to be different from all the people who are surrounding me. Now, if you go to my old neighborhood, um, it's uh, to me, it's, uh, I, uh, we did a, um, documentary with um, uh, CBN, the guys who do the 700 Cup, and they came, you know, they were following me. And I took them to my old neighborhood. And we, I was remember walking down, going down the street and saying, so-and-so lived in this house, so-and-so lived in this house, they're dead. So-and-so lived in this house, they, they're dead as well. They died in a car accident. This one died, they're drunk driving. This one, you know, got lost on drugs. This one is in jail, you know. Uh, and you, I, you know, you couldn't believe that it was a middle-class, Nairobi um, uh, sort of neighborhood. But that's the reality of where I came from. But in that neighborhood, I chose to be different. Uh, and I found myself for a season isolated, and which is why these guys became my best friends. I say that because there's sometimes you will find yourself isolated. If you're going to be a person of integrity in the purchasing department, for example, in, uh, the, in some government office in Kenya, you're going to find yourself swimming against a very um, heavy tide. You're swimming against the tide where people, I, I was talking with somebody at this very table where I'm sitting at uh, on my birthday, a young lady came to me and she's um, in purchasing in one of the, um, one of the um, ministries uh, in, in our country. I was about to say which one, but I won't, lest she be victimized. You see, this is what I mean. She'd be victimized. She's swimming against the tide. And she told me a story of how she chose to do something different. And somebody came to her and said, hey, listen, you know you can drive with this contract. You can drive with this tender. This one can just agree with everybody. And she chose to go against the grain. That is swimming against the tide. That kind of a person will attract 
um, a different kind of person. And those are the kind of people that you will walk together with. And so I think that that kind of mentality, when you find yourself alone with that thinking, you'll find yourself drifting towards the kind of people who share those same kind of thoughts. And that kind of person may not necessarily be in the country that you're in. The people that who encourage you to thrive and become that, you may be mentored by people who are outside of your immediate geographical environment. I'm happy to see people from South Africa, Tanzania, and wherever else here. I think this is important. Uh, I think it'll be <clears throat> critical, but allow me to say one last thing, I think in challenging us. Um, I, I think this is for those who are going to be in, in charge of, who are in charge of or going to be in charge of um, the academic aspects of um, obstetrics and gynecology or medic medicine at large. You know, um, we, we need to make it easy I, uh, please hear me out. We need to make it easy for the people that we we are leading to thrive. I say this because I, uh, in my journey, uh, I attended an online course. There's a thing called EDX and they have various top universities just give all these courses. Some of them are free, some of them pay. Uh, and so I attended Columbia University on uh, Columbia University course and another uh, um, Harvard University course, and it was easy. And I found this to be the case, very different from what our Kenyan uh, university education experience is. The Kenyan university ed education experience is a very hard and dreary and austere experience. And many people from Kenyan universities say, wow, you know, that was not a very pleasant experience. Uh, whereas if you go to American universities, and I'd say private, well, even the public American universities, the experience is very different. I want to encourage us to encourage uh, curiosity. And I think that this is important. When you encourage curiosity and not frown on it, you know, um, this was the typical Kenyan, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you're in the lecture, you raise your hand and you say, uh, I'd like to ask a question. And you ask the question and the person answering the question says, what kind of foolish question is that? Um, you know, to me, that kills curiosity. That says to that person that you're, you're querying is is not welcome. And that means that that's the same thing, that's the same space as what's over on the other side? What's beyond what I can see? What's beyond the, that's what the 14th and 15th century um, explorers said. They said, I want to go beyond the bounds. I'm curious to find out what's there. And I feel that this is something we need to really encourage um, this generation with, to be curious. And not just to be curious for curiosity's sake, but because if that curiosity is nurtured, that is what inventors are made of. That's what innovation is made of. I would like to see the University of Nairobi again be in the place of the top um, research, one of the top research places in the world that if people are looking for research into tropical medicine, research into uh, obstetrics and gynecology and whatever it was uh, that whatever discipline that you're going, if they say in Africa, the place you really need to go is the University of Nairobi. Uh, I know this is strange, but when you go to EDX, EDX is the top universities, top universities. I Unfortunately, I didn't see university. Maybe, maybe this was a while ago, uh, but I didn't see the University of Nairobi. I would like to see University of Nairobi having EDX courses where people can attend and be curious and do something. But I think this is something that we need to encourage. It needs to become a culture. And that culture where we begin to free ourselves from the shackles of, uh, you know, I passed the exam, you know, let's go beyond the exam and say, but really, what are we inquiring about? Can we go to a different place and begin to encourage inquiry at a level that is outside our field of expertise? Not because we want uh, to be mavericks, but what we really want is for a betterment, for the betterment of our society, for the betterment of our department, for the betterment of our community. I think that's what I'd like to say. This kind of, of, um, of, of cultivating these kind of relationships, to me, makes for greatness. Um, allow me to say this. Uh, you know, Kenya and Singapore got independence in the same year, 1963. Singapore got its independence August 31st, 1963. Um, and Kenya, December 12th. But Singapore 
has the number one passport in the world right now. It's the number one most um, uh, flexible passport in the world, accepted in the most places. Uh, and the next four positions are held by Spain, Germany, and the US. Um, and when you check that, you see, but this country, this so-called third world country, in a time similar to ours, has lifted itself up from poverty into a place where it is a first world nation, where people can go and 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 find um, find incredible things. I'm longing for the day that Kenya will be like that. I'm longing for the day when we will say concerning University of Nairobi, my goodness, what an incredible place where people are knocking down the doors because they, they found this a place of inquiry. I say that that comes with leadership. That comes with leadership. The reason Singapore became that is because, and we know the story, Lee Kuan Yew chose to be a very different kind of leader. He was visionary and transformational. What I'm trying to encourage us to become is visionary and transformational. That begins with a small society of people who said, that I'm going to be different. And that's the place that I want us to begin to build from. So um, I'm sorry, I, that was a kind of a long way to talk about um, what, what I'm really, 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 really about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pete. Uh, there's another question. Um, let me see. So the other question is, how can one maintain a personal audit periodically in the absence of a personal retreat and how can one plan and prepare for failure given that it's a part of life and we must embrace it so those are two questions question number one how can one maintain a personal audit periodically in the absence of a personal retreat okay <clears throat> so the first question the first uh, that's a two-pronged question one is talking about um personal accountability the second is is talking about failure so let me deal with the accountability these gadgets this they're, they're so incredible um, um personal accountability is a discipline that's a discipline and uh, there's there's a test there's something that we do i do with uh, my mentorship class um i do a thing that they called uh, biorhythms a biorhythms test the reason the reason a biorhythms test is important for many people is that you know uh, not everybody is a morning person uh, there's this uh, there's the way you respond best and so when we do the biorhythms test is we begin to uncover our best times and everybody has one or two highs when you're at your personal best in the day so what we do is over a week is we we take note we make a graph we make a uh, a sheet, a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet that plots out our highs and our lows uh, when you're at your, your best time. Now, any, any person with uh, any, I, you know, uh, what you may call it, experience will tell you um, that there are times when we respond better. Now, the truth is this, believe it or not, I'm not a morning person. I, I tend to be an owl. I tend to be an owl and I stay up late. I'm better, I'm creative at night. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that I can't wake up in the morning and do a good presentation. I can when I put my mind to it. But I don't usually do this because it's not my best time. It's not my best time. So my best interviews, if I was going for an interview, I wouldn't take the interview in the morning. I'd pick the time when I was, I was best. Now, the time I'm at my best, probably 8 p.m. But most businesses won't... Um, if you're doing a business or even a visa interview, it's not going to be at 8 p.m. But if there's an opp uh, opportunity to do an, uh, an interview at 8 p.m., I'll take it. What's my next best time? 4 p.m. So I'll say, okay, I'll take the 4 p.m. slot because I understand myself. And then what I begin to do is plot it out on my phone. There's so many uh, utilities now that are available on, um, there's so many apps that are available on your phone that will help you keep accountability, whether it's accountability for exercise, accountability for reading. So my wife has a thing uh, and she keeps, and her, her phone always tells her, it's now time to switch off. It's now time to do this. It's now time to, to do that. Uh, and so let this gadget, rather than be a tracking device, be something that's useful for building you be something that's useful for building you and, and causing you to, to be more productive. So I'd say find an app here that's going to help you um, be accountable. I think <clears throat> um, uh, um, personal accountability is where it starts and then accountability with your circle. 
uh, accountability, by the way, is is three ways. There's what I call vertical accountability, where there's somebody over you, your head of department, a mentor, or whoever it is, who is account you are accountable to, uh, whether that's uh, academically or or uh, you know personally, whatever it is, they're above you. So they are mentors above you. So that's person that's accountability upwards. Then there's what I was now talking about, which is horizontal. Horizontal accountability. Horizontal accountability are those who are your peers. Uh, I call them your brothers or your sisters, people who are your peers. And then there is, and this is important for us to begin to understand, downwards accountability. Now, this is something that especially African leaders don't really understand. We are accountable to the people that we lead. This is why when Gen Z rise to ask government questions, you know, government are saying, who are you anyway? Why should we answer to you? Because we don't realize that we're accountable downwards. These are the people who are watching us. And this is not always obvious to us until when you hold somebody in high regard and then they fail, which is the next thing I'm gonna talk about. And then they fail. You know, when you, you really admired somebody and then they were doing something, doing something, and then in your eyes, they failed. That's what downward accountability is, where we hold ourselves to a very high standard because there are people coming after us. And I think that that's important. Um, I think that's uh, critical for us to understand. So let's talk then real quick about failure because I know we're almost out of time and people have to go to their rounds. I want to say something that's important about failure. Failure isn't, I think it was Eric Wainaina's mom who told me this one day I went to visit. She said, you know, uh, failure, failure isn't final. Uh, she said, success, success can be final. And, and when you get there, you say, is this it? Um, so failure should never be final. Uh, somebody actually coined the phrase failing forward, how you can learn from personal failure. I, I think every time you fail, whether that failure is an exam or, or you know, you're, you know uh, in some personal aspect, it's an opportunity to learn. This is why uh, the lecturer then says you need to do a supplementary exam because it's giving you a chance to see, have you learned what your mistake was? So in life, life is constantly giving us, as long as you're alive, as long as you're alive, uh, you're getting supplementary exams. You're getting an opportunity to learn again. And here's the thing that I found is that if, if, if you keep, if you keep getting into the same problem over and over again, it means you're not learning. It means you're not learning. And what I found is that if there's a cycle in my life, I need to start asking myself, what lesson have I not learned in this cycle? There's something in this cycle, this cycle is teaching me something. Why am I not learning? So it's important then to pull up the handbrake and then say, okay, it's teaching me something. Let me look at the patterns, the patterns, and then I can pick it out and say, oh, I, I made a mistake. In, in there's a blind spot I have, and I just didn't know that that was my blind spot. So I think that's an important thing for us to begin to take note. So failure should be an opportunity to learn. And, and if we're in a series of cycles, um, and that series of cycles keeps repeating itself, you know, and not just in, you know, your medical field or anything, even personal, you know, you keep dating the same guy and it keeps ending up the same way. The reality is the common denominator is you. Common denominator is you. So it's something that you have to change. And one day something clicked in my mind. Uh, and that was this. Um, uh, one of my mentors told me something. He said, Pete, nothing changes if nothing changes. Nothing changes if nothing changes. So you have to change something. So it takes some wisdom to understand what it is that you have to change. But if you don't change it, everything will remain the same. And that change begins with you. So I feel that the important place that I've come to in my life, in, in my discovery, is beginning to trace the patterns and seeing what are the patterns, what are the patterns, let me change this, because nothing changes if nothing changes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Pete. Uh, I think one last question here is, how then would you advise uh, that we handle transition, seeing that especially in the world of medicine, we are always transiting from one, one high to the next low. Um, for example, uh, you will be the finalist MBCHB. At that level, you are like the senior most, and then you drop to the lowest low where you are the lowest in the food chain as an intern. And then you become a medical officer after your internship. 
hit the highest high as the senior medical officer only to come into MMED, Masters of Medicine, and you are, again, the lowest in the food chain. Uh, and then uh, you then become a finalist in your residency. That is like the highest peak, only for you to become the junior consultant. So it's always a very high high to a very low low. So then how would you advise um, us who are in the medical field to handle those uh, very uh, pendulous uh, transitions? Very pendulous, well put, very pendulous. Um, <clears throat> in my uh, first book I wrote, uh, I don't know if it's the first book, I wrote, one of the, the last, The Curve was my last book. I wrote something in the introduction. It came as a very interesting revelation. I was, we were driving, we just moved here where we live. Uh, and then there'd been a rainstorm, the first big rainstorm of uh, about nine, 10 years ago. And uh, so we were leaving. And just before we got onto the tarmac off of the road where we live, just as we were getting on, the car, the car uh, to get onto the road, there was a big bump because of the wash by the, uh, by the rain. And my wife hadn't put on her safety belt. Uh, and she was, you know, messing with her phone. And when when the the thing bumped, when the car bumped, she banged her head on the uh, on the window, uh, and it was um, a very hard bump. It really hurt her. Um, you know, uh, as close as you can come to a concussion. I came to a, that's the revelation that that book uh, brought that book into being. You can love somebody. You can love somebody. You can be with somebody and love somebody so much, but the transitions of life, if they're not going with you, if they're not strapped in, if they're not clued into what the next turn will be, then even a person that you love or who is otherwise well prepared, she's a driver, she's, been, I mean, this is not a child. This is not a child. They can be in a perilous situation because of a lack of preparedness. I think here's the thing that there's a saying, uh, and regardless of where you are, the only thing that is constant is change. And change is important because change actually signifies growth. Um, and what you've just described is actually life, is because um, you graduated from childhood uh, as we graduated from childhood in, in one, one way, you know, you were the top student in your class uh, before you went to Alliance. Uh, Alliance people can now um, thank God that I spoke about them today. Yay, there's your plug for the day. Um, so you are your top, you are top in your primary school, then you go to Alliance <clears throat> and you find that your top was actually the bottom uh, for other people. You are an A student, but you're the lowest A student in Alliance. And then you get from Alliance, you go to the medical school, you have all these other A's that are in the country. And then you find that, because that's life, that is life. Um, I think we need to prepare for it in understanding this thing, that our current situation is never permanent, regardless of where you are, that your situation is not permanent, that you're constantly in transition. And it may not always be obvious. Now, there are obvious transitions, transitions of marriage, trans transitions of childbirth and, and so on. Um, transitions, uh, as you said, in, in the medical field where you're, you're going. I think the thing to do is to understand that one thing that um, Eric Wainaina's mom told me, and she was a teacher. Uh, she said something, uh, I, I, I can't forget it. She said, um, challenge, it's a success is final, but challenge continues, challenge continues. So the idea there is to face the whole question of challenge, to say, I want to be better. So I'll posture myself to, to challenge myself to improve, to challenge myself to improve. And uh, I, I think um, that's the important thing. Uh, but here's maybe another thing that I think is, is critical um, for me. Because I have the benefit of now being in my 50s, uh, I, I found um, that one of the experiences is that regardless of what field somebody is in, the emptiness in somebody's soul isn't as a result of their field. It's as a result of 
full, a lack of being fulfilled, regardless of where their field is. And I think it's important to really begin to understand that, that fulfillment doesn't come from more money. More money will make, you know, it gives you access to things and it's a tool that enables you to dress nicely, eat nicely, whatever it is. Um, but that should never be a marker of accomplishment. I think uh, those things, those things can easily deceive us into thinking that. I say this because we're very materialistic in our understanding, but I want us to understand this, that the markers that should fulfill us are the goals that we set out of fulfillment in your soul. And I think that internal fulfillment, if I can sit down and do several things, one is be at peace with myself and say, can I sleep? Can I sleep with myself at night? Can I, is my conscience clear? So I think the clarity of conscience is one. But secondly, how does my immediate society view me? And I, I think um, when you're in, uh, a community of immigrants, for example, that's easier to do than when you're 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 in your you know in, you, if you're Kenyan and all around you are Kenyans. Sometimes it's difficult to do this self analysis how your immediate community sees you. But when you're in a community of immigrants, what tends to happen is that it's a very closed community and they think certain ways about certain people. And I'd like to encourage us to begin to do that in our circle. Uh, really have. Uh, these fungua rojo moments where somebody can really say, what do you really think about me? Let's evaluate. So that evaluation is important. The evaluation of the society. Um, so your personal peace and then the peace of your community because the community is gonna tell you something about you. If they're not inviting you for their uh, weddings and funerals and those kind of things, that means that you've been ostracized from the community. You may be alone, achiever wherever you are, but you'll die lonely. You'll die lonely. And I've met uh, or known of men and women who reached the pinnacle of achievement and then they die lonely. Uh, you know, you thought that they were completely successful, but they were lonely. On their birthday, you'd expect, you know, I remember one of my mentors saying, this guy who was at the creme de la creme. And I met some of them. I mean, I've sat on the table with some Grammy Award winners, top achievers in life who at the slightest, I remember one experience, this guy who had been admiring from afar, was a top award winning guy um, with a voice like, I don't know, you know, one of the greatest singers of our time. We sat down for 10 minutes, we're having dinner and within a minute, he just broke down and began to weep. And I was shocked, he said, my marriage is falling apart. My life is miserable, I'm in debt. And there I was thinking that this guy is an achiever. The point I'm making is this. Fulfillment isn't the accolades. Fulfillment isn't the material things. Fulfillment is inner peace, having inner peace and understanding that I'm doing what it is that I'm supposed to do. Clarity of conscience. Thank you. I think I'm, I've am i done my hour and a half uh, and I uh, anything extra, I begin to charge for. I will do consultation fees thereafter. Somebody's asking, uh, any other questions, you can forward them uh, through Dr. Aida. I know that we'll, we'll, we'll have a good time. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the privilege of your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, just where can we get your books? Uh, somebody's asking in the chat box. You, uh, Dr. Pete, you're muted. Yes. I apologize. Canon Media is my current, I've changed publishers. So Canon Media are uh, republishing, are going to republish uh, my books. So um, wherever Canon Media is, um, well, get in touch with me. Uh, I think I have some copies of the books that are available. Um, my email address, I think uh, will be put in the chat box. You can email me, uh, I'm putting it. Um, and then we can we can talk from there, and I'll get um, uh, I'll get your. Oh, sorry, I I didn't do that right. Uh, hang on a second. I sent that to Kabbalah. I want to send this to everyone. Okay, here we are. Uh, this is my email address, um, and you can uh, just email me, um, and hopefully I'll be able to avail a copy at a small fee. 
the the book should be out this book uh, navigate and the others should be out um by end of next month or beginning of november um so but the other book i think is still available i can make that available if you really want to but that's my email address send me an email and we can respond to the chats thank you so much thank you dr pete uh would you have any um a parting shot and then we can bring this meeting to a close um well, really, just thank you. For, thank you for having me. And um, I, I, I want maybe, you know, people always ask me for a parting shot. That means to close the thought that I was I had already closed. Um, <laughs> no, I don't have much to say. <laughs> I don't have much to say, except uh, thank you for the opportunity given to me. And keep changing. Keep keep striving. Um, remember, everybody has a birthday. A birthday is not necessarily uh, a marker of progress. Everybody has a, uh, has a birthday. We really just have to look for uh, more deliberate ways, more deliberate ways of marking our progress. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pete Odera. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to just give a few um, mentions to countries that are outside of Kenya. I'd like to recognize Pretoria, Af uh, Pretoria, South Africa, Gauteng, South Africa, Nigeria, and I think I also saw uh, Lusaka, Zambia. Thank you very much for making us feel global. <laughs> we are right here at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Health Sciences, the University of Nairobi. Uh, just to introduce uh, next month, we shall be on on the 4th of October, Friday, we start at 7 a.m. East African time. If you will be logging in from Lusaka, Zambia, that is uh, Central African time, 6 a.m. South Africa, so South African uh, time will be 6 a.m. Nigerian time, you do that minus three. Uh, Sierra Leonean time, minus three as well. But East African time is 7 a.m. That will be our next speaker. Friday, 4th October, 2024. That's all for me. I have been your moderator, Dr. Aida Wanjiko. I'm so happy and glad to have been here with you. Thank you so much for tuning in, joining in. And if you want to have a recap of this session, feel free to, to go to our YouTube channel. It is the uh, OBSGAIN Department Wellness Forum. You can replay this uh, session at your own time. Get uh, a few nuggets here and there. Otherwise, from me and the Wellness Committee, just to say thank you for the early morning attendance and do have an amazing day. Until next time, bye-bye.